on that day the lights of a city. Those are the lights that uh, every Christian longs to see. Not a city that's earthly. It's a city not made with hands coming down out of New Jerusalem, and it's a city from which we'll never leave. This morning I want to talk to you about another city, a city that was here on earth. It was called a city of refuge. I don't know if you've ever read in that. It was cities that were set up uh, because the only law they had, the children of Israel and going in, were the, the commandments that God had given them. There were no state government or city government. And so if you will go back and read the preparation for entering that city and all the laws and all of the, the rules and the things that God set up for the children of Israel, you'll see that he had the ability to cover every area of life. One of these areas is for the city of refuge. This city was set up so that if a person accidentally killed someone, if you'll read Deuteronomy 19 and Numbers 35, they give more uh, a, a more intense picture of these cities. But if a person unintentionally killed someone, and, and it's also added, it says, unintentionally killed someone and did not hate him in the past, which means a premeditation, that person could run to that city. Now, in this promised land, there were six cities set up. There were three inside this side of the Jordan and three on the other side of the Jordan because when you read the allotments, several of the tribes uh, of Israel settled on the other side, what's called beyond the Jordan. Jesus did much ministry there. And these cities were so strategically set up that a person running could reach them by at least one day, one day's journey. Many of these cities were a half a day's journey. It made it quick for that person to go. You say, was he running away from the law? No. There was something in the laws that were set up, and if, as you read Numbers and Deuteronomy, you'll, you'll know this. There was something called the Goel. The Goel was near kinsmen. And if something should happen, if a, a part of their family was killed, it was the call of this Goel to the avenger to chase this man down and bring him to justice literally by killing him. So if you accidentally killed a person, you knew that you had to get out of town quick and strategically set up were these cities. I think it's remarkable when you read that in the setting up of these cities, Moses told Israel, now, as you conquer more land, you will set up three more cities. In other words, the provision was made for a place of rescue that could be reached within a half a day or one day's journey. It was called the city of refuge. Turn in your copy of Scripture to Joshua chapter 20. Joshua chapter 20. It'll be on the board, but if you have your Scriptures, uh, I, I, I like holding my Bible in my hand, okay? Here we go. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Say to the people of Israel, Appoint the cities of refuge of which I spoke to you through Moses, that the manslayer who strikes any person without intent or, un, or unknowingly, because he struck his neighbor unknowingly and did not hate him in the past. And he shall remain in that city until he has stood before the congregation for judgment until the death of him who is high priest at the time. Then the manslayer may return to his own town and his own home, so, so to the town from which he fled. So they set apart Kadesh in Galilee, in the hill country of Naphtali, Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim, 
Kareth Arba, which is Hebron, in the hill country of Judah, and beyond the Jordan, east of Jericho, they appointed Bezer in the wilderness of the tableland from the tribe of Reuben, and Ramoth in Gilead from the tribe of Gad, and Golan in Bashan from the tribe of Manassas. These are the cities designated for all the people of Israel, and note this, and for the stranger sojourning among them, that anyone who killed a person without merit should flee there, so that he might not die by the hand of the avenger of blood. Notice this was in the land of Israel. However, it was for the Israelites and for the sojourner, that is, the Gentiles in that area, anyone who was not a Jew. So it was not a closed city. At the beginning of my message, I want to make something very, very plain to you, please. This is not a message about sanctuary cities who have taken it from the sublime to the ridiculous. That's not what this is all about, okay? And that's all I'll say about that. These were cities because things happen in life. And when you study these, it, it, it's great. Uh, a lot of that you will learn, or I've learned from this, is in the Word of God, but also they had what was called rabbinical traditions. Now, that type of tradition is different than our traditions. You know, some uh, coaches, if they win the first game and the players, they won't shave until they lose. Or you wear a shirt and shirt on game day. Or something that we hold as a tradition. In the Baptist church, where things are supposed to be set. And then we sing the song, just like a tree planted by a river, they shall not be moved. And those things become ironclad traditions. Now the traditions were kind of like commentaries to the law. They further explained the extent in the reasoning behind the law. These cities, as I said, were strategically set so at the most it was a one day journey from anywhere in Israel on both sides of the journey. That manslayer could flee. Not only that, the roads leading to that city were strictly maintained. In fact, once a year, the elders would gather and they would walk that city, uh, from that city, that road to the next city leading to their city and make sure, I guess you would call them, there's no potholes, make sure that the road is in good condition, make sure that there's no bushes that would hide the road. In other words, it was a plain, easy run to get to that city. Not only that, if they were, there were any rivers that crossed that road, they were instructed to build a bridge so that no one would be hindered from reaching that city. Not only that, all along the road to all of these cities, and this was done in all six cities, but along every roadway there was a sign that said, City of Refuge. I don't know if it said City of Refuge up ahead, City of Refuge in five miles, but in bold printing in which the elders maintain annually, it was pointed out this was a City of Refuge. Back at the city. These cities in this, these days were walled cities, and they had a gate that was open in the morning and a gate that was closed in the evening. Not so of the city of refuge. In the city of refuge, the gates were open 24 hours a day so that no one would have to, and when they had somebody in hot pursuit, stand and holler and holler till they got those big gates open. They were continually open. And not only that, there were lights all along the wall. So as that manslayer began to run from one place down this road that said the city of refuge, he could see in the distance the flames of the light. Hence I played that song, the lights of that city. And they could see the lights. As they got nearer, they could see that 
that open door. Tradition says that like most towns, there would be people who lived outside the gates. Many of those were people engaged in agriculture, uh, sheep, oxen, other things of that nature. They, they made their abode outside. I guess you would call them the suburbs. And it's said that when that manslayer was running, when he reached the suburbs, the manslayer could not get him. But the manslayer had to walk to those gates once he was there The manslayer, the avenger, could not get him. Safe when he got to the suburbs, but he had to go in. Now right now, as I always do, I point out when I make analogies to things. And I want you to know that every analogy will fall short, so be careful Uh, of using analogies and thinking just because one or two things are true it's always true it's not and even in this analogy I stop short but what I see is this the church this location this 20 something acres that we have could be a city of refuge I want to say very quickly and we'll probably say later that just coming to this church will not save you. Just joining this church will not save you. So in that, that way, this analogy stops. But I've often looked at that church for those people who are just burdened. Have you ever watched people when you go out? Whenever my wife goes with me sometimes, she'll say these famous words, Honey, could we just stop to this store for a minute? There was some, we were going to Publix, and could we just stop at TJ Maxx? I think someone's calling my name. Or, or she'll go in and she'll look. Now, my wife is not that big of a shopper. I'm going to say that before I get in trouble when we go home. But I let her wander around and look, and I watch people. I watch people when I'm shopping. I watch people no matter where I go. And I want to tell you today, there are literally thousands of people under the shadow that we walk every day that are desperately needing a city of refuge. I watch parents who are very sharp and mean and hurtful to their children. Husband and wife fight. I I listen to family issues, I listen to squabble, squabbles, I see all of these things which is simply frustration in life. In psychology it's called the kick the dog syndrome. Your wife jumps on, or excuse me, your boss man gets on you at work and chews you out and when you come home your dog runs to you, happy to see you, and you kick him. The dog's done nothing to you. But that's the first object that you see to take out frustrations. You see, today we're living in a time when people are living in frustrations. There are financial frustrations. There are frustrations of interpersonal relationships. There are frustrations within the family. There are addictions that are literally dragging the soul of this country down into hell. And every day, state after state decides we need to legalize it for one reason. Not for med- med- medical purposes, but so the government can get taxes off of it and get into the addiction business. People live addicted And if you ask them, are you happy with your situation? If they were honest with you, they would tell you no, but then they would come back and say, what in the world am I going to do? You know, most addictions, most problems lead from that first right turn off of the right road. You kind of get off in what I call the bushes. And you stay there, and you stay there so long until you really can't find your way back. I used to hunt quite a bit, and we would go to the Ocala National Forest. 
and you had to learn some tricks when you got off and chased those dogs that were hunting. Once you got about 20 feet off of the roadway and turned around and looked, you couldn't see the roadway. It disappeared. Every tree looked like the other tree. But if you were wise and wily like a fox, you would walk till you found power lines. And before you went into that forest, you would know where these power lines begin and where they end and where they intersect. And so you would inevitably get lost, but you'd look up to look to the power lines. Today, the name of Jesus has been blasphemed to the point that he is simply just another form of religion, not the hope that men and women desperately need in this life. Hope that tomorrow they will have hope that their circumstances, their situations can be remedied. Hope that goes beyond what this world can offer. Because the hope of this world is just like everything in this world. Listen, you can pay a hundred, a couple of hundred thousand dollars for that Mercedes, and I don't care what they say about it, it will rust, it will dent when somebody hits it, and sooner or later, the motor's going to go wrong. In this world, even the best of solutions go wrong, but yet we are continually pushing people to the solutions of this world. I believe this church, you notice we've got all the woods cut out, we're waiting for dry territory and that wonderful soccer field to spring up. If you'll also notice if you've been coming by, this one gate is open. When I came here, I questioned why we had gates open. It just kind of bothered my, or shut, it kind of bothered my spirit. And There was a good explanation, you know, trucks turn around and tear up concrete. But it's always bothered me when I went by, so I really kept it to myself until other people began to say this. Pastor, have you ever gone by our church? It looks like the gates are shut. Looks like we're out of business. To begin with, that gate is not going to stop anything from happening in this property if somebody wants to bad enough, okay? I'll tell you the secret. It's a little snap. You snap it, push the gate open, have fun. So what are we guarding? I tell you what we're showing, this place is closed. And I don't think this place should ever, ever have the appearance of being closed. When a person walks through these doors haughtily, maybe just not even saying, I'll go in there and relax, but just going in, may the welcome and the love that they sense here, the worship of the Lord God, and the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ be that effect that they can be led as God speaks into their life to that one person who is the refuge, Jesus Christ, our Lord. In the coming weeks, I hope that you will begin to see through our parking lot and through other things a welcoming. I call it curb appeal. How many of you watch the same shows my wife watches. Little house and barns and, and flip, for a, flip for a flop or flip for, for money. You know, they're always tearing something up, rebuilding it. And I noticed them rebuilding a house last night. And the thing that worried me, when they tore the inner walls down, there was water stains. And nowhere in that program did they repair the roof. Now, I'm critical when I watch that. Oh, you forgot to do that. No, curb appeal. Curb appeal outside, the warmth and the welcoming inside. Because I want to tell you something, folks. We have not been set up to adjudicate guilt or innocence in a person's life. That, my friend, is the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, we are welcoming in that we do not condemn maybe someone who may not look like us or act like us. We want them the opportunity within our gates to feel welcome. You know, 
when you're in a hurry, when, you, when, when your life seems like it's coming apart at every way, you have financial problems, which leads to family problems, your children may not behave, uh, you have problems on your job, it just seems like everything else, and right in the middle of all of that, when we have our coldest day in Florida, your hot water heater breaks. And you have all of these problems, and then you're called on every moment of the day to make a sane decision. You see, the peace that Jesus Christ gives us is that peace beyond understanding. The peace in the financial crisis when the children are not minding us and the husband and wife are fighting and the water heater breaking. The peace of God that goes beyond all understanding that speaks into our life and says, this is not all of life. This is where you are now. This is where you're going Thus, the hope that we have. Now understand, the hope we have in Christ goes beyond a new water heater. The hope we have in Christ goes beyond financial freedom, children that mind, jobs that are, are just great. The freedom that we have that as we live in this life and death calls us home, we don't blink, we are in the presence of God. And for there, we're going to be therefore in eternity that's the true refuge in this city the manslayer would run to the gates and he would explain to the elders this is what happened the elders would then bring him into the city make him comfortable find him a place to stay and at a certain point the community would meet the manslayer would say tell them the conditions of why he was there and if the community said truly this man meant no intent sometimes they would wait for this meeting till they could get witnesses from where he came from but when the community said this person this disqualifies to live in this city of refuge that person could live there and continue living there they would find a place they would help him with his lodging the only thing was that person if he left the city of refuge and the manslayer was there that go well that avenger could take his life so he stayed in this city but there was a catch when the high priest died which most high priests were very old and this was something that occurred many times when the high priest died, he was adjudicated as innocent and he could go home to where he lived free of any record. Remember at Easter I told you that word tetelestai means that it's finished. And whenever you owed a person a debt, maybe $100, they would write $100 and they would nail that board upon, above your sale. And when somebody went and paid for that, that, uh, that $100, they would take that board down, and they would stamp it paid in full, and you always carried your board with you just in case somebody said you still owed. When the high priest died, this man was a free man forever. You say, well, preacher, that's a good story. What does that got to do with anything? The Old Testament is a shadow of what was to come. Okay? The New Testament is what came. Too many people put away the old and say, oh, that's just the old. Jesus said, I did not come to do away with the old writings but I came to fulfill them and take them into the reign of Christ. So we have the shadows. You know, you can look at trees and you see a shadow. You can see a shadow of things. They're, they're not real, but they reflect the real. One day Jesus was born in a manger. One time Jesus lived, called to him disciples, healed the sick, raised the dead, gave sight to the blind. It was a day that Jesus put his hands out on that cross 
They were, his side was pierced, his hands and feet was pierced, and he play, paid the only sacrifice that God would take for the vengeance of God between man. Jesus stood between God and his vengeance towards a broken, evil creation. Jesus paid it all to tell us that. When you read in the book of Hebrews, it says, Jesus, many places, is our high priest. He is the one that offered the sacrifice for your sins and mine. And so I take this view of this city. The city towers were raised high so that people running from a distance could see those towers. Jesus Christ was raised high on a hill on a cross, publicly slain for our sins. Not only that, just as the highways leading to that city was cleared of debris so that it would be straight, Jesus said, I will make you a highway in the wilderness. I want you to know this morning if you are struggling to come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you're going through what many people do, uh, can I give it up or this, and you're trying in your mind to figure out the only stumbling block once Christ has called you is an unbelieving heart. Because the road to Christ is open. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it to the full, to the abundance. Jesus said, I have come to seek and to save that which is lost. Jesus said through the writings of Paul, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Therefore, those that Jesus seeks are people just like you and I. They were signposts all along the way. I believe those are the believers. No matter where you go, you are a signpost to a place, to the suburbs, to the city of refuge. Because if you will do something that takes no time, just simply invite someone. Let me tell you about my church. You can say they have great singing. We've got great children's program. We have this. We have that. Just invite someone to come. You're the signpost to the outskirts of the city of refuge, which will be preached from this platform every Sunday. Jesus Christ. We are those signs. The city offered support for the refugee. You know, many times we worry about how can I console someone? How can I help someone? And for that reason, we tend to just simply back away. Can I tell you what the one thing is people who are struggling in life needs? They need a hug. They need just somebody to stand there and say, I'm listening. And when you have listened... Pray to the one who hears and the only one who can answer. That's the encouragement. Nobody wants to hear, oh, it'll get better. I had an aunt who had that. She got better. I did this and it got No one in the theories of, of addiction, in the pain of suffering, people who are literally running for their lives every day, they don't want to hear stuff is going to get better. Because that's, what, that's all we can say. It's going to be better. How do we know it's going to be better? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. It is Jesus who will begin to walk with that person. It is Jesus that says, cast all your cares and your burdens on me because I love you. Our job is signpost, hug, an understanding ears, and a prayer. It's not ignoring stuff. We ignore stuff. Or I don't want to get involved. Jesus said, get involved. In fact, Jesus got so involved, it killed him. You say, oh, I don't want to, you're not, don't worry about it. <laughs> I don't think any of us are going to be so involved, somebody will wipe us out. But we may be the encouragement that causes someone to believe that the next day 
that time they can find hope. The city was a refuge for all. And our high priest has already died. If you're here this morning and you've been struggling with that call of Christ, you, you just don't know what to do. Listen, we have an invitation song. You just come down and say, Pastor, I am wrestling with this. I don't know what to do. i got all the time in the world for you. Any other that you may have confidence in, they will talk to you. We are citizens in the community of the city of refuge. See, our high priest realized that the wages of sin is death. So he died in order that the gift of God would be eternal life for all who would seek him. For you visiting and those who have visited with us and uh, you're, you're looking for a church home, and I truly believe every person needs a city of refuge to live in. That's why we have these communities. Mutual encouragement, mutual care, being able to reach out and, and help meet needs and just, just be this light, the signpost in the community. That's what Community Baptist Church is all about. We're all about people. We're not about programs. We're not about stuff. We're all about taking the message from here next week, posting a signpost that says you can come here and find warmth, openness, and friendship. But most important, you're going to hear about Jesus, the one who, as we sang this morning, paid it all. All to him I owe, Jesus our Lord. Fathers, we come to you. We thank you, Lord, that you yourself became our city of refuge. All who run to you, Lord, find eternal life. None is cast off. This morning in this, this building, this congregation, there may be those that feel like the weight of the world is on them. Father, they'll find their respite here at an altar, casting cares and problems and entrusting all of their hope to you. God, you don't tell us step by step how you're going to fix it. You've just said you come to me. I'm life. I'll lead you in life. Lord, God, today may we not be leave this this building today with the same issues we walked in with. Oh, the problem may still be out there, but if we've turned it over to you, Lord, it's now in your hands. And like that city of refuge, we can live in peace because, God, you're taking care of it. If there's a person here this morning that God, you have spoke to them time and time again. You've called their name. They know you need a Savior. Lord, let this day be the day that they run to the city of refuge called Jesus Christ. Lord, if there are those that you're leading into this church to be a part of this community, the suburb of refuge, Lord, may today be that day that, Father, we can get on with the business of reaching out as you told us Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria the other most parts of the earth God today I pray your word will have freedom in our lives that you call us and we will respond in Jesus name